right. Gonna be doing a sermon here about isolation and thought it'd be a good place to do one out here in the woods by myself. Just myself, my Bible, King James Bible, and the Lord, and the camera. It's, uh, getting a little bit warm out here, so I'm just gonna roll my sleeves up, grab my Bible. All right. <laughs> This study is going to be, does John prophesy isolation before the catching up? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says here, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, of course, if you understand anything about the King James Bible, you'll understand that that is obviously uh, a type of the catching up of the body of Christ. Okay, the rapture, many would call it. Uh, obviously, you can see it there. He's there, and he hears a, a voice, like a trumpet, talking to him and saying, Come up hither. The two passages that specifically state about the catching up of the body of Christ is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. And the second one is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. And both of them mention the trump of God. The trump is the sound that a trumpet makes. It does not say trumpet of God. It's the trump of God. The sound of a trumpet. A voice talking with me like a trumpet. You see, it's a very easy tie in there. You can understand the catching up before the events of the time of Jacob's trouble, before the first seal is opened. But uh, how many people got caught up? Just John. You say, well, then only one person's going, no, 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 don't get ahead of me. No, I didn't say that. All right. But the whole point of this sermon here is to make you realize that there's not going to be a vast majority of people that are going to be leaving. Okay. It's not going to be that everybody's just wonderful and there's going to be millions and millions of Christians that get taken up and whatever else. Millions disappear. I don't think it's going to be millions. But uh, what's the condition of a Christian, a Bible believer in the end times? Okay. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. An old time uh, way of, of punishing people was isolation. In fact, it's still done today. You put somebody in the hole, you put them in solitary confinement, you put them in this place here and you let them all by themselves. Um, and people say, oh, what a terrible torture. Well, you know, you, as you get older as a Christian, you start to look at that and say, actually, it's not so bad. <laughs> um, I'm real thankful that I'm not in some church building right now uh, that I've designed and built myself and I have my faithful following there and, and they all worship me and, and they all say, we love you, preacher. You know, our pastor is so wonderful. We have Pastor Appreciation Sunday and all this other stuff. Um, and they do nice things for me and I'm building up the cult around my personality. I thank the Lord that I'm not in that. Uh, I almost get, did get into that years ago. That almost came upon me. Um, I was going to church buildings, Baptist church buildings, and it was, you know, they were looking for a good preacher, and there was some talk that, you know, Brother Brian's going to be the preacher, and I, he's got the talent, and he's got the whatever personality and things, and, and, and I saw it, and the Lord got me out of that thing, but, you know, later on as I saw it, I'd, I'd just run from that thing. I don't want people worshiping me. Never have. It's about the book, as I've said so many times. Uh, it's about the Bible. King James Bible, okay? But as you get older as a Christian, as you mature as a Christian, you'll outgrow the little baby centers called church buildings where people talk about the weather and talk about sports and politics and whatever else, and they don't they get nervous if you bring up controversial subjects. You'll outgrow that stuff. I mean, you mean to tell me your whole life as a Christian revolves around going to some building two times a week or three times a week? You know, I'm in fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ when I go there to the church building. And there's nothing wrong with fellowship, by the way. I'll, I'll just say that. But the whole point is, people say you're disconnected if you're not part of that. 
and you're browbeaten by the church building, the churchgoers, if you're someone like myself that goes out into a place like this and says, I want to read the Bible out here and preach the Word of God out here. They say, who are you accountable to? Where is the church? But you're supposed to be part of a New Testament local church. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and these things are where at? Where are these things at in Scripture again? And you can pick the people that you're accountable to, by the way. That's why do you go to the specific church building that uh, you get along with the people there. You know. But I'm going to tell you right now, I believe firmly that John is a type of the church and what John is going through in the book of Revelation, that he's in exile, he's, he's by himself on the island of Patmos. I believe that that's going to be the condition of true Bible-believing Christians. Could there be somebody that's saved that's just newly saved or that's just backslidden or whatever else that's going to some church building someplace? Sure. I'm not going to say that everybody that goes to a church building is lost and on their way to hell. I'm not going to say that. There's people that do all kinds of dumb things that are Christians. All right? But a true Bible-believing Christian, you're going to find the older you get in your walk with the Lord, the longer you're saved, the more difficult it is to be around people, especially today. I mean, you could make an argument for church buildings and church get-togethers and things back in the early 1900s, back in the 1800s big revivals and stuff like that. There'd be a lot of people that have things in common today. I don't think so. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You say, well, brother, that's written, you know, that's the Sermon on the Mount thing, and that's, that's written. I know, I'm dispensational. But you know what? It's a truth that crosses dispensational lines. The vast majority of people are headed for, for destruction, headed to hell. Only a few number of people are actually saved. Very few. And you'll learn that as you grow as a Christian. You first get saved, you say, well, praise the Lord. We live in a Christian nation. We got a Christian president in Donald Trump. And this is so wonderful. He talks about God. He says he's a Christian, you know, and, and things. And never mind the, the fornication and adultery and, and all the other things and crude stuff that he says. He's a Christian because he says he is. And, you know, and then you start to actually read the Bible and you say, oh, okay, now maybe he's not a Christian. He's actually Jesuit trained and... Uh, Okay, um, well, we still got a lot of good churches out there. And then you go to these good churches and all of a sudden you're seeing the corruption and you're seeing the lying and the deceit. Okay, but there's still some good Bible-believing Baptist churches out there. Okay, we still got those. We still got those. And then you go to those and you see, you talk to the pastor and you realize uh, actually he doesn't even believe in the King James Bible. He believes it has errors in it and, and you know, calls it a heresy to believe that it's inspired and whatever and and all of a sudden, that number that starts out about that big gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And all of a sudden, you're at home watching a video like this going, nodding your head going, yeah, I've been through it. <laughs> yeah. But the church building people will say to you that you're wrong, that you're in sin because you didn't go and compromise at some church building somewhere. It's weird. It's wrong to be isolated. Isolation breeds contempt. It breeds, it breeds a cult mentality. Uh, no, cults are actually, you can't have a cult of one person, okay? Uh, cults are large groups of people that are subservient to the cult leader, all right? Me coming out here and worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth out here in His creation and giving Him glory for what He makes, that's not cultic, Okay? True biblical isolation breeds a stronger relationship with the Lord. Okay, as I said before, my isolated Christian imperfection uh, study that I did years ago, um, if I never wanted to be alone with my wife, uh, I always wanted my friends to be around when I'm with her, wouldn't that be kind of a sick relationship? Wouldn't that be kind of a little weird if I'd be afraid to be alone with my wife? Well, uh, we're the bride of Christ. If you're saved, why don't you want to be alone with your 
husband-to-be, your betrothed husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, well, we're supposed to fellowship. Sure, fellowship's fine, but you've got to have that personal relationship that's uh, isolated. Hmm. Straight as a gate narrows the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. What does John see when he looks up into heaven? He sees a door. Hmm. Very interesting. First Timothy chapter six. See, there there are certain passages the church building hirelings will never ever preach the truth of what the passage is saying. Because you see, they're trying to get people into the pew. And so you got to put the people down. You got to say, you know what? If you're not coming to church every time the doors are open, what's more important to you? The, the sports game or your church? The church family should be more important to you than your physical family. Amen? Amen? That's right. Preach it, brother. Amen. But what about certain verses of Scripture that say contrary things to that? Uh oh. They don't want to talk about that stuff. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is, a pr he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such, continue going there because you can make a church good or bad. And it doesn't matter what they say. Is that what it says? No, actually it says, uh, from such, withdraw thyself. And yet the Bible building hirelings would have you believe, no, actually, if, if a church is imperfect, then you need to be there to make it stronger. You need to be there to, to bring the revival in there. And you need to be the, the voice of truth and, and things. And yet you go to these places and the pastor doesn't care what you have to say. And the other people don't care what you have to say. And they start to look at you as a troublemaker if you say, you know what, I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect book. And you shouldn't be up there, pastor, saying it's the, the Greek word should be better translated here and blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't be questioning it. Oh, you're one of those King James only cult members, aren't you? You know, see? And you go through all those different things. The Bible says you're to withdraw yourself. When you see that kind of thing going on. But that might lead to isolation. You can pretty much guarantee that. Second Timothy chapter three. Verse one through five. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Are we in the last days? Yes. Are perilous times here? Yes. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. I mean, we could do a whole study just on these things in here, but the key is verse 5 having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Turn away? That might lead to isolation, though. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll lead to isolation. Um, you get out there and you see these Babel buildings and things, and you get around other people and things that call themselves Christians, and, and you just look and you see, hey, they're not going to change things here. They're... They all think I'm nuts and they, whatever else. Um, if you're a Bible-believing Christian and you go to some church building that's got all kinds of corruption issues, uh, you know what they want? They don't want compromise as far as they're not going to compromise to you. They want you to give up your beliefs. Let's not talk about that here, okay? You can have your beliefs, but just... I don't want you bringing that stuff in here, okay? If, if you are going to say those things to other people, you're causing division, and I'm going to have to ask you to leave, and we're going to have to have church discipline. And what it... They have a form of godliness. They can say the right things. They can talk about Jesus, and they can sing nice little hymns, and they can whatever, whatever, but they deny the power thereof. 
What's the power in a Christian's life? The book. How can you continue fellowshipping with people that don't believe that this is God's book? You say, what should I do, brother? From such, turn away. Bye-bye. Not going to be coming back. Continuing. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 9 through 11. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. How many Babel buildings out there, how many church buildings are even concerned with truth, with absolute truth? Not very many I've ever been to. And somebody, of course, is going to say, Oh, my churches, we are, we're concerned for truth, and we have this, and we have that. <laughs> I'm sure. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove? That sounds so negative, doesn't it? And I mean, if you're reproving them and having no fellowship with them, uh, what's that going to lead to? Isolation. Oh, it's such a terrible thing, isn't it? Isolation is just such a terrible... No, it isn't. You know how you keep things pure? Isolation. You know, I'm sure that uh, John could have done things a little bit differently in his ministry there in the first century, and uh, he wouldn't have ended up on the island of Patmos. He shouldn't have been quite so dogmatic, you know what I mean? I mean, if he would have just been there and said, well, you know, uh, the Jews, they reject Jesus as their Messiah, but, you know... Uh, I'm not going to say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You know, I mean, some of my other disciple friends, they, they were doing that and they got in trouble. I mean, they're going to jail and everything else. You know, I, I, I'm here to, to bring unity. You know, let's bring unity. Let's all just kind of get together and things. You know, if John would have done something like that, he wouldn't have been on the island of Patmos as an old man. Hey, you know, the, the picture of that whole thing is just so funny. You hear you get the di disciple Jesus loved, and here he's an old man, and they're, and they're, you know, whoever put him out there on the island, you know, I don't know if it's the Roman soldiers or whoever, but they're taking him, you know, and they're probably taking him. He's an old man, and he's, you know, kind of, and they say, get up, old man, you know, and they throw him out onto the shore, and they say, you know, see you later, pal. You know, ha, 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 have a good time surviving, and they, they sail off, and John's there, you know, picking himself up. Right back. Uh, dusted himself off and I well, really did it now, didn't I, Lord? All right, well, let's go find something to eat, I guess. And he turns and, <laughs> you know, what a picture. You know, boy, modern Christianity, well, they could just relate so well. <laughs> you know, this great saint, this great, you know, soldier for Jesus Christ, and he's being tossed onto an island as an old man. Can you relate? Have you had people turn against you that you thought were saved? Have you tried the church building thing and just corruption and corruption and corruption and finally just throw up your hands in defeat and say, you know what? I don't even want to go anymore. You know, I mean, I've said this thing and I've, I've talked with brethren about this for years and, and I've talked with so many people on this and, it, and it, you know, you get to a point with going to this church thing where you get up on a Sunday morning and it's just kind of a, <sighs> all right, well, let's get dressed. <laughs> and, you're, and you're just kind of going, oh, I hope it's better this week. You know, you're, if you're married, your wife says, well, honey, maybe they aren't going to do that thing there again. And, you know, let's just, let's just pray about it. Let's just see if it's better. And you go in there and it's worse. <laughs> and you just, oh, you know. Your week's going by at work and whatever else. You're getting towards the weekend. You're going, oh, great. Going to have to go to church again. <laughs> you know, you get to that point. It's just so bad. It's so vexing. What do you do? Just compromise. Just keep your mouth shut so you don't end up on the island, you know, by yourself. You can avoid isolation that way. Or do you just say, I don't really need anything but Jesus. 
things are getting more corrupt, I'm not going to. I don't want to be like a Laodicean type of a Christian. It's neither cold nor hot. It's lukewarm. And God says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Of course, talking about you know lost people, they're not saved. But the whole point I'm trying to make is instruction and in righteousness. Being lukewarm is not something God wants. You know, man looks at John in isolation on the Isle of Patmos and he says, what a failure. John, the disciple who Jesus loved, and he's on an island by himself? As an old man? I mean, why didn't he plan ahead for his retirement? Why didn't he think about making his, his golden years more comfortable? Think of, the, think of the things that John could have had. I mean, he could have written books. He could have, he could have done theological treatises on... on, on th th See, the world looks at John in isolation on that island of Patmos, and they say, what a failure. But the Lord looks down and he says, what a success. The Lord looks at you right now as a Bible-believing Christian and He says, what a success. I'm glad there's somebody that stands for me, that stands for my word, that's not going to compromise, that doesn't care how unpopular it makes them, doesn't care how isolated it makes them. They're going to stand no matter what. That's where I want to be when I hear my name come up hither. Standing for the truth. I'll have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. I don't want anything to do with it. Let's continue. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 through 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and continue with them. <coughs> oh, excuse me. It says avoid them. Avoid them? Avoid other people? Other saved Christians? Your brothers and sisters in Christ? And you're supposed to avoid them? Huh? That's what the book says. That's what the Bible says. And as time continues and goes on and on and on, the dividing lines are getting more and more defined. Stronger. So that you can't say, well, you know, eh, okay, that guy's, you know, he wears a suit and tie and I don't wear a suit and tie. Well, you know, but we still believe the same doctrine. That was what it would have been in the past. Today? Oh my no. I mean, you'd have had, you know, pretty good unity back in the 19th century. Go to a camp meeting. I know that uh, I read a lot of the accounts of the old camp meetings and things and you'd have Lutherans there, you'd have Presbyterians there, you'd have Methodists, you'd have Baptists and, and whatever else. Getting along. Pretty good. They still had some little fighting and whatever else, but uh, today? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Went past this Methodist uh, church this morning, drove past one, and uh, the preacher's a, a female, a black female, and um, there's a minivan sitting right out front of this church building. You know, one of the people parked there, got the big Masonic, you know, square and compass on it. Freemason. <laughs> sure, why not? But I guess I should go and be part of that because they call themselves Christians, right? It'd be better for me to be in there worshiping with a bunch of lost people than it is for me to be out here by myself. I don't think so. Avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I can tell you right now, the vast majority of church buildings, the only way that they can continue is by good words and fair speeches. Look at the bulletin boards. There are signs out front of these church buildings. It's all positive. It's all good stuff. God has a plan for you today. You know, pull little Joel Olstein you know, up there and just saying, God has your best life. He has everything planned for you. You can be a rich, filthy rich con art <coughs> preacher just like me and, and uh, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. How many people does Joel Osteen have going to his church? I don't even know. What, 50,000 people or something crazy like that? Or I don't even know. I guess his stadium holds that many. Or I don't know how many of the, the lying devil has going to his little organization there. But he keeps them in with good words and fair speeches. Your best life now. God has plans for you. God wants to prosper you today. <laughs> oh, 
make me want to puke. Interesting, because that's exactly what God does in Revelation chapter 3. But, but again, brethren, don't feel that you're somehow wrong or bad or whatever else because you've tried to get along with other people and things and you've tried to go to church buildings and what, and you just finally get to a point where you throw your hands up in despair and say, you know what? I got to get away from all this stuff. You're doing what the Bible told you to do. The Bible does not say that you're supposed to compromise. The Bible never says, well, okay, you see some false doctrine, you see some problems, and just go there, just keep your mouth shut. You know, just the Bible doesn't say that. Show me where in the New Testament that you're told as a Christian to not divide over doctrine. It's okay. The absolute truth that does not exist. We all have our own truth and whatever. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what John believed. That's not what John taught. That's why John was on an island by himself when the Lord called him up. And friend, let me tell you something. There's a real good chance you're going to be by yourself when the Lord says, come up hither. We'll get back to that. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. One of the most abused portions of Scripture. I've heard this thing lied about and lied about and lied about because church buildings can't preach what it's actually saying in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, friends, see, this is a thing that's very important for you young people out there. i got to put on the act here. You know, I'm smiling and things. You know, this is so important for you young people to understand. The Bible here is saying that you're not to be unequally yoked together to somebody else, to an unbeliever in marriage. Okay, it's so important that you have someone that's equally yoked together in Christian faith so that you have a good Christian marriage. And that's it. Marriage is, okay, instruction in righteousness, yeah, maybe, but this passage is not at all about marriage. How do you know? Verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them. Are you getting married to more than one person? Why is them plural? Why is a plural word used? In other words, more than one person. Why? Because it's talking about fellowshipping with unbelievers. There's an S on the end. Unbelievers. You fellowship with unbelievers. Where? Church buildings. This passage of Scripture right here totally, 100% condemns the modern church building that everyone's welcome in. And hey, we're having revival meetings this weekend, so why don't you invite your lost relatives? And we can all stand around singing, uh, Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Come on, cousin, sing the song. You're lost and on your way to hell, but it's okay. Just sing the song along with everybody else, and you can sing that you're saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. I never sang this song before. It's kind of nice. It has a catchy tune to it. I kind of like the way the band's playing it and think That's pretty good. I like that. And, you know, and of course, that's conservative Baptist type things. But you go to these modern church buildings and what do you get? You know, I believe I can fly. You know, I believe I can, you know, I can't even do much more than that. I'm going to vomit if I do. You know, you see what I'm saying? Total abomination to the Lord to have saved professing Christians and lost people in the same place worshiping God. You know, we've, we've made it a practice every Sunday that we go and we try to do something to worship the Lord. We go out into nature. Or we go, we, we just want to get away from, you know, our ministry office and things. And, and we just, we, we have to double down and make sure that we're extra careful to really kind of enjoy the day. And, and, and a lot of times I'll just start out praying Sunday morning and I'll say, Lord, I'm real sorry for what's going to happen today. 
I'm real, real sorry. I can't control it, Lord, but I know it's very vexing to you to have all this wickedness out there being directed at you. And the people saying, we're doing all these abominations that are condemning your word, and we're going to say that we're doing it for Jesus Christ. Ugh, how horrible, how terrible. Absolutely disgusting. No, the truth of the matter is here, brethren, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18 is condemning worshiping in public places where anybody's, anybody can come in. It condemns it. And what's it say there? Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, isolated. And, you know, you can look at the thing scientifically and you can say, what are they at? what's the average church building now? It's a lost people social club. That's all it is. A bunch of lost people. You say, well, Brian, I don't believe. Walk into it with a King James Bible on and start telling truth. And watch how quickly you're asked to leave. Why? Because they're lost. You can't have fellowship with unbelievers because the unbelievers will draw you back into their system. You're to uh, <coughs> be separate. Why? To maintain your purity, your sanctification. Hey, I just took a shower, but I'm going to go over there and roll around in the dirt, and there's a mud puddle over there. I'm going to go jump in that and play around in that, and, and here's a moose went and you know made a little pile there, and I'm just going to go kind of put that on my face a little bit, but I'm still going to be clean. I'll still be clean. I'm not going to be dirty. I'm not dirty because I'm, I'm washed, you see, and, and things... It, no, it doesn't work that way. Sanctification requires that you isolate yourself from some things. If I'm clean, I'm walking around through the woods. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go play in that dirt over there. I'm not going to go jump in that, you know, mud puddle over there. And you're going to step in, oh, oh, okay, there's a moose droppings, you know, or, or whatever else. You stay away from it. Why? To maintain your cleanliness. When you're saved as a born-again Christian, there are certain things you need to stay away from. Don't say, well, I'm going to go to the bar. I used to have a problem as an alcoholic, but I'm going to go to the bar because they have really good bacon cheeseburgers. And the french fries are awesome. So I'm going to go to this place that serves alcohol. Yeah, there's people around me that are getting drunk. And yeah, there's people around me that are using profanity and doing all these other things. But it's okay because I'm not doing it. So it's okay for me to be there. No, it's not. No, it's not. And as a Christian, you go to a place like that, it'll vex you. At the gas station yesterday and pumping gas and this teenage kid pulls in with his pickup truck and he's got this rock music blaring and I'm just over there just, you know, wanting to plug my ears up and things. Why? Well, I used to listen to rock music. What's wrong with rock music? I'm born again now. I'm saved. Rock music vexes me. So I just kind of sat there and just said, it's okay. I'll just kind of, you know, take my time here and just kind of, maybe I'll hang out with the kid. And whatever. No, I was, thankfully, I was just about done pumping my gas. And so I pumped the thing. Okay, get my receipt and hop in the vehicle and go. I don't want to be around that stuff. I didn't go home and say, hey, the, you know, that, that tune kind of stuck in my head. I'm going to see if I can find that online. See if I can find that song quick or something. Isolate yourself, you see. Sanctify yourself. Why? To maintain purity. John sanctified himself. Years and years and years of preaching the word to the point where people hated him so bad they didn't say, oh, he's an old man, just respect him. Okay, just let him alone. He's just kooky or whatever. Grab that old man and stick him on that island over there so he can't bother us anymore. Is that going to be a condition of you at the catching up? Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four, verse eleven. Paul writes here, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. <laughs> I love that. The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived. 
towards the end of the ministry, only Luke's with me. You see it over and over again. You know, uh, these brethren, they departed from me, and this guy here, he departed from me, and this one here, he's, you know, trying to destroy me and things. The Lord reward him according to his works, and I turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Only Luke's with me. And yet you say to the average modern Christian, um, yeah, I'm just here in the area, and uh, boy, I, only my, my one friend is with me. They'd say, well, then perhaps you need to move to an area where there's a good local Bible-believing New Testament church. Local church. Excuse me. Paul didn't. You mean the guy that wrote most of the New Testament didn't try to get more fellowship with people? Hmm. Kind of interesting. Revelation chapter 1. So what's this all about, brother? I would say there's a couple of things that I've gotten over and over and over again in my years of ministry. And one of the big ones, you know, they say if I had a dollar for every time I heard such and such, I'd be a rich man, you know. Uh, one of the big ones is, brother, I'm struggling with loneliness. I don't have many friends. I don't have many people to be around. I just wish I could find a Bible-believing Christian in the area here. And you know, and, and you see somebody and you, and you get to talking to them and they say, oh, I'm a Christian. And you, and you kind of go, really? You know, and, and you're thinking, oh, is it real that I, I could have fellowship with this person? And you start talking to them and all of a sudden they're getting angry and they're, you know, and they're, and they're going, yeah, I go to some church building and I use the NIV and what's wrong with the NIV? And you, you try to tell them and, oh, and you start to see the nervousness back and forth with the feet and, and, you know, and it gets worse and worse. And finally you're going, okay, well, have a good day. And you walk away going, oh, I almost thought I found one there, you know, almost thought I found another brother or sister in Christ. And you just look sometimes at the world and you go, isn't anybody saved in my area? It'd be just... It's lonely at times. But what's the point of it? Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Are you going to keep the things that are written in this book? Or are you going to compromise? Well, I used to be King James only, but I realized that that was divisive and I couldn't find a good church in my area. So I started going to a church that was kind of, okay, it's a little bit non-denominational. And, and sometimes it, the teens do some CCM stuff, but it, it, it's, there's some really good people there. And I mean, okay, they don't use the King James Bible in every service. Sometimes, sometimes they do, but and okay, they, they kind of worship Donald Trump, but you know, and they're not really that hard on the Catholics. And in fact, the one time I kind of mentioned something, it was kind of a nervous situation. I was told afterwards by the pastor that I shouldn't bring it up anymore. And, but it's a good church. You know what you're doing? You don't want to be on the island of Patmos. You don't want to keep those things that are written therein. You want to compromise. I want to be around other people. I don't want to be seen as some lone nut someplace. I thank the Lord that I got over that many, many years ago. I've always been somewhat of a loner and things, you know, but you know, the, the people, oh, that lone nut Denlinger, he's out in the woods all by himself just preaching to trees and things like this. Well, praise the Lord, okay? <laughs> I'm glad I can be around God's creation, you know? It's nice, I enjoy it. Um, I'm glad I don't have to compromise. I've been in the church buildings, I've preached. I've preached, I've seen the faces, I've seen the people, you know, they glare and they've got their arms folded in there and they're just glaring at me. And then after the service, I see him back there with the pastor and, and I see the pastor and he's, he's like this and the person's going, you know, I see that I see their back and they're going, you know, and they're, and they're, they're giving the pastor, you know, what for. And, and, uh, and a little while later, the pastor comes to me and he says, Hey, you know, I'm shaking his hand after the service and Hey, uh, brother, um, just, you know, just, just a little suggestion. Could you kind of tone down things? Yeah. I've been there. You've been there. I'm sure you have. 
But the Bible says there's a blessing to those that say, no compromises. Jesus didn't compromise. He didn't go to the cross and say, He goes, puts His hands down on the cross and says, not my will, but thine be done, Lord. And they take this, the spike and they go to hammer it in and He goes, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? And the Roman soldier says, well, this is crucifixion. Oh, oh, well, tell you, I don't know if I want to do that. I could bleed. Um, put it under my wrist and then kind of take a leather strap, you know, and kind of strap me to it. You know, that might still work. You know, would that work? Can I have a, kind of a little bit of a seat here on the cross where I can kind of sit a little bit? My, it's going to make my legs awfully tired. <laughs> he didn't compromise. He didn't take it easy. He died for you. He died for me. Why on earth would we compromise? How can we look at what Jesus Christ did, his horrible death that he died on the cross, and say, you know what? I just got to kind of back off a little bit on some of the truth that he showed me, all right? Because I got to be around other people. I don't want to be isolated. John was isolated. Are you going to be isolated? When Jesus Christ says, come up hither, will you be found faithful? And let me just say something else. If the catching up happens today, later today, after you get done watching this, um, how many people would notice that you're gone? And uh, even more um, thought-provoking, how many people would care that you're gone? How many people do you think cared when John disappeared? You know, they say, well, John came back down after the writing of the book of Revelation. I don't see that in the Bible. They say, well, tradition tells us, tradition tells us all kinds of things that are stupid and, and not true. I don't see any proof that John came back down. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I don't know. I see him, he's up there with the Lord. He doesn't come back down to the earth. Let's go with that for a minute. John, come up hither. Whew, up he goes. A couple months later, some soldiers come out and they say, we ought to check on the old coot, huh? Well, he's probably skin and bones by now. Yeah, we'll find his clothes probably. He's, you know, he's probably dead. That guy, I mean, he was old enough anyhow. I mean, you know, he's pretty old. And they go out there, John. Hey, John. Apostle John, where are you? Walking around. One of the soldiers comes up. Did you find him? No, I haven't seen him. Huh, that's weird. Well, you, you know, his clothes got to be laying here someplace. No, I can't find his clothes either. Do you think if those soldiers went, oh man, we lost a good man. They probably said, okay, let's, let's all right, we did our, our work. We, you know, we'll fill out the report when we get back onto the ship, you know, and tell the captain, you know, that, uh, yes, sir, we, uh, you know, reporting for duty, sir. They said, okay, um, what's the report on John? How's he doing? You know, we got to take this report back to whatever. Um, Sir, we couldn't find him. Did you search the whole island, soldier? Uh, yes, sir. We searched everywhere. Okay. Missing person report. Uh, did, you, did you find some clothes at least? Um, no, sir. We did not find any clothes. We found nothing. Do you think the commanding officer said, uh, oh, boy, well, I went out to go to shore, and he probably said, okay, fine. Uh, missing in action. Okay, yeah, all right, that's good enough. Okay, let's, let's set sail. All right. Hoist the anchors, come on, let's get out of here. Come up hither, boom, up you go. Police going through, checking, going door to door. Knock, knock, knock. Okay, bust the door and there's, there's nobody answering here. Boom, they bust the door and they come in. Uh, hello, is anybody here? Uh, there's been some disappearances. We're just making sure. Hello, hello, hello. Walk into your study there and there's the Bible open. Oh, they got there. Okay, they got one of these Bible things. Uh, is anybody here? Okay, just uh, write this up. <laughs> Say, what are you talking about, Brian? I'm talking about isolation. John, I believe firmly, pictures the condition of a Christian at the catching up. 
See, we often think about, oh yeah, you can see it, Revelation chapter 4, it's so exciting. He's there, he looks up to heaven, he sees the door open, he hears a voice talking like him, like a trumpet, talking with him. He says, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. <laughs> up he goes. Picture of the rapture. Isn't it wonderful? Praise the Lord, that's beautiful. And it is. But you don't often go beyond, the, before that, well, not beyond, but before that, and look back and say, what was it like there before? John was isolated. I know a lot of you, written back and forth with you, and I know that you're isolated. You won't compromise, will you? John didn't either. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I don't know how much longer we had to go, but the time's at hand. And as time goes by, more and more of us are going to be on an island. If you aren't there already, the Lord will get you there. You'll realize, I can't compromise. I can't be with these other people. I want to be found faithful. I want to be the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Does He love you? Are you isolated? Do you get nervous having to spend time alone with your Savior? I hope not. I pray you take these things to heart. If you're alone, be encouraged. That was the condition of John. If you're compromising and going to some church building someplace and you know that there's things that are wrong there, you know that they're saying things and they believe things that are wrong and wicked, I pray that you get off alone. Isolate yourself. The Bible says to. Read passage after passage after passage. From such, turn away. Withdraw thyself. Have no fellowship. Avoid them. Will you follow the Scriptures? Are you going to keep those things that are written? Or are you going to go with compromise to avoid being isolated on an island? Please do the right thing.